Imagine we have a mass hanging by a really light string from some fixed point. And imagine that this mass is moving in a circular path as shown here and as also shown in the opening video clip. This configuration is known as a conical pendulum. So, imagine we have a conical pendulum with hanging mass given by little m with length capital L from this point here to the center of mass of the mass and with an angle theta between the string and the downward vertical direction. I want to note, if this is truly a circular path, then this angle theta will necessarily be constant. All right, so given m, l, and theta, we're asked to find the tension in the string, we're asked to find the speed with which the mass is moving in the circular path, and we're asked to find the orbital period. The orbital period is the time it takes for the mass to make one full circle. A quick note on notation. Period is often represented by the symbol capital T, but I want to use capital T for tension. So for orbital period, I need something else. I'm going to use little t sub o for time for an orbit. Also, I want to note that since our given information is provided in terms of symbols, then our results are going to be in terms of some combination of those symbols and or physical or mathematical constants. Before we start, let's give some thought to how we're going to solve this problem. So let's look at what we're asked to find. We're asked to find the tension. Tension's a force, so we're going to need to do some sort of force analysis. And that calls to mind Newton's second law. We're asked to find the speed. So we imagine this object as it's traveling with some speed. Well, it's traveling in a circular path. An object traveling in a circular path experiences a centripetal acceleration. That is, a centripetal acceleration that points from the mass toward the center of the circle that it's traveling in. So when it's over here, it's experiencing a centripetal force to the right. When it's over here, it's experiencing a centripetal force to the left. All right, so we know we can relate the centripetal acceleration magnitude to the speed that the mass is traveling at and the radius of its circular path through this expression here. So finding the speed relates to the centripetal acceleration. Accelerations are related to forces through Newton's second law. So again, that points to Newton's second law. So let's use Newton's second law to relate the forces acting on the mass to the acceleration of the mass. I've written it in vector form, but we're going to use it in component form. So first, we want to draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on this mass. I could draw a free body diagram for any point in the motion, but it's convenient to use either this point or this point because that's when the centripetal acceleration will be in the plane of the riding surface. Remember, the centripetal acceleration points toward the center of the circle from wherever the mass is. So when the mass is here, the centripetal acceleration is to the right. When the mass is here, the centripetal acceleration is to the left. So either of those points would be convenient. I'll draw a free body diagram corresponding to this location here. So to do that, I'll represent the mass right here. Gravity exerts a downward force on the mass of magnitude mg, where g is the magnitude of the free fall acceleration. The cable exerts a force on the mass that's up and to the right along the direction of the cable. I'll draw that in. That has magnitude t, where t is the tension in the cable. To apply Newton's second law in component form, I should choose a set of component axes. I remember when the mass is right here, the centripetal acceleration, which points from the mass toward the center of the circle, is to the right. So that's a convenient direction for one of my axes. So I'm going to take to the right as my positive x direction. I'm going to take up as my positive y direction. All right, so I want to resolve all my forces into components along these axes. Mg is already fine, it's in the negative y direction, uh, but the tension force will have components both along the x-axis and the y-axis. So I should break that up and find those components. Sketch those in here. And I could represent this angle here. Now I want to note, taking this up here, a vertical line here is parallel to this vertical line. So if this angle is theta, then this angle here is also theta by alternate interior angles. So I'm going to just write that in there, theta for this angle. All right, now I could draw this component right here. Uh, 
this forms a right triangle uh, here, here, and with magnitude t as the hypotenuse, or I could put this one over here and form a right triangle there. Anyway, putting this one up here, that's opposite to the angle theta, opposite goes with sine. So this here, this component will have an amount t sine theta. Meanwhile, this side is adjacent to the angle theta, so this one will be t cosine theta because cosine goes with adjacent, sine goes with opposite. To remind myself that I've replaced the tension force with its components, and to avoid double counting, I can cross it out. That's optional, but I'm just going to do that. Also, next to the diagram, I want to indicate the direction of the acceleration. That acceleration is to the right. That's the centripetal acceleration, and that has magnitude v squared over r, where r is the radius of the circle. And that's the only acceleration in this problem. This mass is not accelerating up or down. Uh, it's only accelerating because it's moving in a circle, and that centripetal acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. At this instant, it's to the right. I don't put this on the diagram. On the diagram, on the mass itself, I only have the forces acting on the mass. Those forces relate to the acceleration of the mass. That's a separate thing. OK, so with this information, I can write Newton's second law in component form. Look in the x direction, and in the y direction, we can start by looking at either direction. I'll start with the x direction. So the sum of the forces acting on this mass in the x direction equals the mass of the mass times its acceleration in the x direction. So looking at the forces, the only force in the x direction, or only force component in the x direction, is a t sine theta, and that's in the positive x direction. So I'll write t sine theta, and that's it. On the right-hand side, I've got the mass of the mass times its acceleration in the x direction. Uh, this is the acceleration in the x direction. Uh, the, it's the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r. So I can put that v squared. Now, for r, that's the radius of this circular path. That's this right here. So this side is opposite to this angle. We have a hypotenuse of L. So this side will have a length L sine theta. So I'm just going to put that in right there, L sine theta. And that's in for the r. That's the radius of the circular path that this travels in. One common pitfall would just be to identify this length and somehow imagine that's the radius of the circle. But it doesn't travel in a circle this way. It's traveling in a circle this way. We need the radius of the circle. That's what goes in for r right there. All right, so we have one of our unknowns, the tension. We've got our other unknown, the speed. Uh, we can't really get any further, so let's hop over to the sum of the forces in the y direction. So looking in the y direction at the sum of the force components acting on this mass, uh, I see this one and I, this one. So I have t cosine theta in the positive y direction. I'll write that in here. And in the negative y direction, I have mg. So I've got plus a negative mg or minus mg. And then uh, that's equal to the mass of the mass times its acceleration in the y direction. This isn't accelerating in the y direction. It's only accelerating in the x direction. There's no acceleration in the y direction. So m times 0 is 0. Uh, and now I can solve for the tension by adding mg to both sides and dividing by cosine theta. So I'll get that the tension equals equal to mg divided by cosine theta. Great. So that's one of the things we are looking for, the tension in the cable. I can now take this tension and plug it in for this T here. So let me do that. I'll put that right here. So this is in for the tension. Uh, I'll write the rest of the expression here. Now I have an M on both sides, so I can divide both sides by M. And I can multiply both sides by L sine theta to get this. And I can take the square root of both sides to get the speed. If I want to get cute, I can note that sine squared theta is sine theta times sine theta. I can take one of those sine thetas, divide by the cosine theta to get a tangent theta, and rewrite that here. And that's our speed. Now, as I noted earlier, for the mass to travel in a truly circular path, 
the angle theta must be constant. So that means that tangent theta and sine theta are constants. L and G are also constants. So that means our speed is constant. So the mass is traveling in a circle at constant speed. So to get a relationship between the distance the mass traveled, the speed the mass is traveling, and the time for one period, we can just use distance equals speed times time. So I'll write right here. Now, for one orbit, the distance will be one circumference, and the time will be the orbital period. So I can put those in here, where the speed is this speed, and I'll put that in later. Now, the circumference is 2 pi times this radius. So I can put that in here. And the radius right here is opposite to the angle theta in a right triangle with hypotenuse L. So the radius is L sine theta. I'll put that right here. So if I divide that by the speed v, I'll get the orbital period. I'll write that right here. Now all I need to do is plug in one of these expressions for the speed. This one turns out to be more convenient. So I'm going to plug this in here. I'm going to flip the sides and rewrite it down here. Looking at this, I see an L here, an L there, a sine theta here, a sine squared theta there. To simplify this, it'll be convenient to take the L sine theta, square it, and then take the square root. So I'll rewrite that right here. Now I can put all this under one square root. I'll do that here. Looking at this, sine squared theta divided by sine squared theta gives me 1. L squared over L gives me L. I'll have 1 over g, and I've got 1 over 1 over cosine theta, which will bring cosine theta to the top. So doing all that, I can rewrite this here. And we get that the orbital period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the quantity L cosine theta over g. All right, I might as well box this result and all the others, so let's do that now. So before we get too carried away, congratulating ourselves on a job well done, we should at least check the units of our results. So let's start right here. Tension should have units of force. Cosine theta is dimensionless. M times g gives us units of force, so the units here check out. Moving to our orbital speed, tangent theta and sine theta are dimensionless. L has units of length. G has units of length over time squared. So overall, I've got length squared over time squared into the square root. When I take the square root, I get length over time. So the dimensions of the speed check out. Finally, looking at the orbital period, that should have units of time. Cosine theta is dimensionless. L has units of length. G has units of length over time squared. So I'm going to have length over length canceling and 1 over 1 over time squared, giving me time squared under the square root. Take the square root of that, you get units of time. And this is dimensionless here. So overall, this comes out with units of time. So the units check out. All right, before signing off, I want to point out an interesting feature of our results. While the tension depends on the mass, the orbital speed and the orbital period do not. There's no mass here in any of these. Now, these do have dependencies. The orbital speed and the orbital period both depend on the length. They both depend on g. They both depend on the angle, but neither of them depends on the mass. To see why they don't depend on the mass, let's go back and look at our Newton's second law in the x-component analysis. The sum of the forces in the x-direction was just this horizontal component of the tension force, the T sine theta. The tension turned out to be proportional to the mass. So we had mass on this side of the equation as a multiplicative constant. Meanwhile, on the other side of the equation, on the right-hand side, we've got mass times acceleration. So the mass was in on the right-hand side as a multiplicative constant. So the mass just canceled out. You could divide both sides by the mass. So that's why the mass does not appear in the expression for the orbital speed or for the orbital period. All right, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.